There are a number of horror games on the PlayStation 2 which weren't released in the West. Games like Hungry Ghosts, Shadow Tower Abyss, and the Korean exclusive Mystic Knights were never officially localised for English-speaking audiences. Despite the language barrier, this hasn't prevented there being a fan base in Western countries, and many games, regardless of genre or platform, have received fan translations, finally making them accessible for even more people to play. But there's one Japanese exclusive horror game that could probably be considered as one of the most obscure titles on the PS2, even more so for the survival horror category. And that's the Taryo Jigoku, which can be roughly translated to the overwhelming hell. The game hasn't received an English translation, or much coverage at all for that matter apart from some older Let's Plays. But luckily it's not too dialogue heavy, and has small amounts of text you can get away with Google Translating to get the gist of. So I felt like it was something I could play despite not knowing the language. The Overwhelming Hell is volume 113 in the Simple 2000 series, which is a collection of budget games released by D3 Publisher, with the 2000 in the name indicating the 2000 yen price tag for the games within its series. There are over 400 games in the Simple catalog, and roughly a quarter of those are PlayStation 2 titles. The games in this line are developed by several different studios, but it's Tamsoft, creators of a fairly known Simple 2000 title, Oni Chambara, who made the overwhelming hell. Given the low price tag, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to assume it's one of the lowest budget survival horror games on the PS2. The only game I can think of that might beat it is Demon Summoner, which apparently took three months to develop and makes a simple 2000 title look extremely polished in comparison. Despite my apprehension about its overall quality, I was interested in discovering if the overwhelming hell is still a good experience. The game is a fairly bizarre take on Alice in Wonderland, where you play as a high school girl named Erica who forgot her mobile phone in her classroom and goes back at night to retrieve it. She finds that a white rabbit in formal clothing seems to have run off with it, and follows it through a portal which transports her into another world or hell. As she searches for the rabbit, she makes her way through stages teeming with giant creepy crawlies and other unsightly creatures. This ranges from spiders, frogs and pill bugs to disembodied hands and floating eyeball spirits. They always come in groups, and if they spot Erica, they will continue to swarm her until she falls to the ground. The gameplay loop involves finding the portal to a hell in one of the school's classrooms, then using it to transport to the corresponding level. The main goal is to first find the white rabbit, whose locations and drops are somewhat randomised. You'll be able to pick up letters that the rabbit leaves lying around which feed you some story elements along with hints on how to proceed. Essentially, you want to keep sniffing out, sneaking up to, and catching the rabbit until it drops a key, which you'll need to access the boss area. You can easily see the rabbit's whereabouts on your map by checking for a red mark, and you can also hear Erica's ringtone emanating from his pockets if he's nearby. After you've got the key and possibly some nifty items, you'll need to track down the boss which will require you to maybe release a bridge, lower the water level, or even find another key to unlock the path. Once you locate and beat the stage boss, you head on over to the newly spawned portal and arrive right back at the school to find the next hell. The Overwhelming Hell is a mix of stealth gameplay and combat. You can crouch, tiptoe, walk, or run around the levels. But of course, the faster you move, the more sound you make alerting any nearby enemies to your presence. It's not exactly the most exciting stealth gameplay of all time, but I didn't really mind the slow movement considering it gives you a moment to appreciate some of the surprisingly cool visuals. You can also knock out your enemies using various weapons like golf clubs, bats and broomsticks that you find within the levels. They do eventually break, but they appear very frequently throughout the game. Some weapons are sturdier than others depending on if they're made of wood or metal, and they each will default to an overhead, mid-swing, or low-swing attack when standing. The mid-swing won't work on short enemies, and overhead won't send enemies flying that far backwards. 
the low swing weapon, the golf club, is definitely the most useful. However, I prefer to save that for boss battles. Even without any steel pipes or wooden sticks, Erica has another trick up her sleeve, with that being the jump button, which is super rare in the survival horror genre. She can straight up squish any opponents below her, stunning them momentarily and allowing for her to quickly bypass a horde of spiders without getting caught. In addition to this, she can also pick up and throw enemies to not only damage others, but also permanently get rid of the one you've thrown. You can even jump and throw to get them to travel further, and that's something you'll have to do for one boss in particular. Spirit enemies like the floating eyeballs can only be downed by shaking them off, or using either eye drops or a fooder, a kind of paper talisman. It's worth noting that these items are something you'll definitely need to be in possession of for the fourth boss of the game in order to beat it. The other common evil spirits you come across can be jumped on since they're small and close to the ground, so they're easier to deal with than the eyes. There are even more specific tools you can find that will help you deal with the other insects and critters you'll be facing. You have the option of bug spray and a party popper to instantly down a flood of creatures charging towards you, and they are extremely useful for getting through tight walkways without any trouble. That being said, jumping through enemies at the right time is a very good strategy too. There's also a flashlight which seems to scare the nasties away, although I didn't really ever use it personally. Running and jumping will use up your stamina bar, and once your meter depletes, Erica will stop and recuperate, meaning that if you're being chased by a horde of bugs, they will catch up to you. If you've been grabbed by a surge of enemies, you can shake them off, which will also temporarily stun them. Particularly in higher difficulties, enemies catching you in a stun loop is more likely than you'd think, since their stun times seem to be a lot shorter, and Erica's tolerance for having her personal space invaded by creepy critters is a lot smaller. The way that health works in the game follows a stress system, and having any kind of enemy attached to you will add to your stress level indicated by the symbols on the top left of the screen. It reads as Zoa Zoa, which is what you'd use to describe an icky feeling, like you've got goosebumps or you're creeped out. Once that increasing panic level exceeds the limit, Erica will faceplant on the floor and the player will get a good old game over screen. However, so long as you manage to get away from your pursuers, your condition will return to normal, as will your stamina if you stand still or walk instead of run and jump. The game is made easier by the inclusion of two kinds of healing items. The mint candy will negate any stress Erica has accumulated, and the pills will do the exact same, but they also seem to make you invisible to enemies for a short time. It's good to save both for any sticky situations you may find yourself in. As I mentioned before, at the end of every hell you have to fight a gatekeeper, or boss. While the designs of the common enemies are already quite varied, especially for a roughly 3 hour game, the bosses themselves are even more impressive. I'm a sucker for massively scaled up creatures that are typically minuscule to us, because it brings out some really amazing detail we're not necessarily used to, and makes them look a lot more alien. My favourite is the colossal fly boss of the third stage. You can see its gross spiky hairs and horrifyingly large proboscis as it buzzes around you. Turns out for some real skin crawling monster designs, you can just look at an insect for a microscope for some inspiration. I don't have a huge fear of bugs in real life, but imagining how squishy the giant moth body must be makes me feel queasy. It's not the first time Big Bugs made their mark on the Simple series. Earth Defense Force and Global Defense Force both released a few years prior to the overwhelming Hell's debut, and featured oversized ants as one of the main enemy types. There is one boss in Erica's journey that is somewhat human though, which is a menacing, monstrous head that scuttles around on six legs. It's definitely a successful, disturbing design for an imposingly large enemy. With the right weapons and items in hand, even these bosses can be as simple as the usual insects to deal with. In general, you want to be using the smaller enemies they occasionally pump out to your advantage, 
and batting, throwing or swinging them right back at the boss will for the most part be the only efficient way to beat them. After they take a specific amount of damage, they'll start using a new move, which is essentially trying to cover you in some sort of liquid or gas that rapidly increases Erika's stress level and can mean instant death on the hardest difficulty. Luckily, simply running away from their attack is all you need to do to avoid this. Oh, and I have to say, the boss fight music is very good. The game includes five different locations, all eerily absent of any other human presence apart from our protagonist. There are moments where you'll find refuge from floods of insects, giving a sense of odd tranquility as you overlook the area. There's a particular bridge section in the castle level that I couldn't help but stop to take in. The camera is further away from Erica than usual as she moves forward, with nothing but darkness in the background. For a moment, it reminded me of the kind of architecture that features in Fumito Ueda's games and the powerful sense of scale they use, which caught me off guard because I didn't think the overwhelming hell was going to surprise me in that way. In general, there are a lot of views that you'll find in the game that genuinely look really impressive from a stylistic standpoint. It's something I really appreciate about retro games overall that developers are able to create visually interesting games despite numerous technical limitations. And I've always been someone who has more of a connection to the lower poly graphics of past consoles, as opposed to the most realistic looking games modern technology can provide. With the overwhelming hell, even when there's just a simple forest or castle, the way that these crunchy pixels obfuscate the environment just makes me feel so nostalgic. The empty school hallways very much offer that typical liminal space imagery that I spoke about in my last video, and coupled with the different fixed camera positions, you get some really great compositions throughout the game. You'll tread through dense forests teeming with frogs and wasps, and visit a lone cabin ominously surrounded not just by water. The dark murky sewer tunnels force you through mobs of unrelenting rats but provide you with a brief respite on the thinner walkways. An old western style castle greets you with a not so quiet garden, and you follow its stone steps to its uncomfortable halls and gloomy dungeons. You'll even get to traverse the streets of a Japanese suburb, with rolling hills of green against the ominous orange horizon. These pockets of silence amongst the infestations you're confronted with are what really made me appreciate this bizarre wonderland. While Erica hunts down the rabbit through the hells, you can read the letters he drops indicating that he believes her phone to be an antique clock, which turns into a music box and a lantern, despite that actually just being the phone's ringtone and flashlight respectively. In response, Erica worries that he'll end up breaking her phone, and is determined to get it back. At the end of the game, she finally faces off against the white rabbit on the roof of the school building. Once you defeat the giant furry thief, there are three different outcomes you can receive, that being the good, normal, and bad endings. The requirements for each are down to how many of the rabbit's letters you pick up, as well as the number of enemies you've thrown, which are fairly random conditions to fulfill since they're not directly related with what happens in the ending scenes. For the normal ending, there are two possibilities to unlock it. You can either collect 15 or less of the letters and throw more than 49 enemies, or collect 16 or more letters and throw less than 49 opponents. It turns out the rabbit has come to the real world in search of the queen, where she is believed to be resting, but it seems he doesn't even know what she looks like, mistaking Erica for his majesty because she happens to perfectly match the description of fair skin, hair, two arms, and two legs. This ending shows Erica explaining to the rabbit that she isn't in fact the queen, and he rushes off back to the normal world to find the real queen, leaving Erica presumably trapped in this other world. The good ending, on the other hand, requires the player to collect 16 or more letters and throw more than 50 enemies. 
This time, the rabbit gives Erica her cell phone back, and she sees that she's missed a call from her mother. She complains about how late it is and how she's going to be in a lot of trouble, asking how the hell she's going to get back home. The rabbit decides to help her and tells her to close her eyes and count to three. Erica is finally back in her own world, and she even receives a call from her senpai who asks her out on a date. Now, the bad ending instead involves taking more than three hours to beat the game, or collecting 15 or less letters, and throwing less than 49 enemies. After the rabbit wakes Erica and tells her that she was having a terrible dream, he remains convinced that she is indeed the queen and brings in her loyal servants who have all gathered to witness her reawakening. The rabbit exclaims that they have nothing but admiration for her, so much so they appear to want to eat her. Erica shouts that this must all be a crazy dream, but he replies saying she can no longer return to the other world, so she gets swarmed and I guess eaten by bugs. As far as unlockables go, the game has two alternate costumes, each with three colorways. However, if you beat the game on all difficulties with both the normal and good endings, you can unlock new voice types. Essentially, this gives you the option to replace the default Tokyo dialect with ones from Aomori, Okinawa, or Osaka, for instance. I've never played a game that has unlockable character accents like this, and it's honestly the funniest thing ever because it made me imagine an English voiced game getting a Scouse dialogue option, which I genuinely think is a brilliant idea. I will say overall this kind of option is a really unique way to make a playthrough feel very different to the last, so I actually really admire that about the overwhelming hell. I started getting into the habit of checking websites for older titles through the Wayback Machine, and I was glad to find one existed for this game. It welcomes you in with some appropriate visuals as the game title is revealed underneath a blanket of cockroaches. On one of the pages you're introduced to the kinds of enemies you'll encounter along with some screenshots, and there's general information about the setting and gameplay too. But one thing I'd like to mention is that they describe the game genre as panic action, really putting an emphasis on the stress mechanic rather than anything else. There's also a page on the site that seems to be some kind of minigame where you have to use your mouse to escape the bugs, but unfortunately it didn't work for me. I seriously miss this kind of games marketing with flash sites, so I wanted to at least give it a small mention. I will always appreciate a janky game that fails in an interesting way far more than an extremely polished game that doesn't dare do something different. So as much as the overwhelming hell isn't as elegant of a gameplay experience as other titles, I feel like it does enough of its own thing to make me really value the good bits. The mechanics are fairly diverse for a game this small, and the jump button alone is a standout for a survival horror title so messing around with that was pretty entertaining. I really like games that take an established genre and twist it just enough so that fans of said genre are surprised by what it does differently, even if it is just a jump button. Whether or not the player likes that is totally subjective, of course. But at least for me, I revel in the odd little distinctions between video games. I don't want to play the exact same thing over and over again. The overwhelming hell has a very special atmosphere with some very goofy moments, and I almost wonder if the low budget and maybe subsequently a lack of a super serious attitude gave the developers more confidence to just do whatever, without any pressure to be making a AAA blockbuster hit. Playing this strange survival horror gave me more confidence to try out Japanese games that similarly aren't too dialogue heavy. And I'm not sure if that's something you would want to see covered more on the channel, but you're welcome to let me know. It also reminded me how much I adore the use of insects in monster designs for survival horror. And I know there's a game called Escape from Bug Island on the Wii which has previously caught my eye, so I look forward to getting my hands on that eventually. In conclusion, I wasn't expecting much when it came to the overwhelming hell, 
so I was pleasantly surprised to find that I had a great time with it. And who knows, maybe one day it'll receive its own fan translation. <laughs>